Well, good morning, Southern Oregon, and welcome back to The Real Estate Show. I'm Alice Lima. I'm a broker here in beautiful Southern Oregon with John L. Scott Real Estate, and I'm your host here at The Real Estate Show. And we have a fabulous, fabulous interview today with permaculturist Karen Taylor. Now, permaculture may or may not be a word we all use every day, but it's quite fascinating. It's a science, it's a holistic approach, and Karen is a specialist in permaculture, and she teaches and lectures on the subject quite frequently and is involved in helping to educate the real estate agents here locally. So stay tuned for a really informative and quite interesting interview with Karen Taylor. She's here locally in Ashland. Um, just a quick note before we get to that wonderful interview, let's talk about what's going on in the market because because lots and lots have happened this week. The stock market is all over the place. Our local uh, housing market is a little bit jittery. The sellers are a little nervous. The buyers are a little nervous. Everybody's trying to figure out what to do. Well, we got our year-to-date report from our local MLS, SOMLS, and here we have the data, and data does not lie. So here you go, Jackson County, year-to-date, February last year to February this year, guess what? The prices are only slightly higher, median prices only slightly higher than this time last year. Now, that doesn't mean people aren't listing higher. It's what actually sold. So it's almost the same. But guess what's different? We have a lot more listings on the market now than we did this time last year. And the difference between what people are getting for their property versus what they're listing for is way down. We call that the list price to sold price ratio. In Jackson County, the list price to sold price ratio is way down from this time last year. And you know what else? The days on market are up. However, the days on market in Jackson County are still pretty skinny. So, um, you know, it's still kind of a medium market, a little bit on the seller side, depending on what price range you're in. But overall, the market is different than it was last year. Let's take a quick look at Josephine County, our sister to the north. Josephine County selling prices are above what they were this time last year, but again, not by much. Um, and they also have a lot more listings than they did last year. And their prices for what they're actually getting versus what they were asking. So again, the Josephine County list price to sold price ratio is way down from this time last year to now. So the days on market, they're up too. Now, that doesn't mean that the world is falling apart but it does mean that the market is changing. And that's why we have this show every week so that you can be good consumers because you have the information on the spot. So with that said, let's have a quick word from our sponsors and let's get on their interview with Karen Taylor, permaculturist. Stay tuned. Well, good morning again, everybody, and welcome back to The Real Estate Show. I'm Alice Lima, broker John L. Scott here in beautiful Southern Oregon, and I'm so excited to introduce my friend. I'm such a big fan of Karen Taylor. She is a permaculture educator and designer. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Karen. Hey, Alice. It's really great to see you. Well, so for <laughs> um, our folks out there in Radio Land who may not know what permaculture is. How about we start with that, a little bit about what that is and who you are. Great, yeah, well, so permaculture is a, it's a design, um, it's, it's a design philosophy. So it's really based on principles and ethics uh, that are really come from indigenous cultures that are resilient. So they're able to respond to changes and with, with climate change and who knows what else is coming, um, being resilient is super important these days. And so um, permaculture's basic ethics are care for the earth, care for people, and re reinvesting the surplus back into our natural systems. And yeah, so that's that's kind of the basis. It's it's whole systems design. So it's looking at the big picture. It's looking at how all of our different systems like waste and water and electricity, how do all of these systems work together? And it also includes farming and gardening. Um, 
And then um, I have been involved with permaculture for 25 years now. Wow. I, I learned about it. My background is interior design and in the design field, there's a lot of waste and a lot of, um, you know, wasted materials. And so I started studying ecological design and then that led me to permaculture. And it's so permaculture design ties it all together. It kind of brings the built environment with the um, natural environment and how do we, um, how do we live in a way that's much more cohesive and holistic? Wow. So that is a great explanation of permaculture. And I did not understand um, the entirety of it. And then I also did not know you had a design background and I've known you for years. (laughs) (laughs) It's always so funny what you find out. So um, when you're talking about um, including all of the elements that just sounds like a lot of moving parts. How do you address the the needs of the forest and what's going on with the water and the weather with what the humans need and want? Like, how do you pull all that together? That's a great question. That's a really great question. And so we have a series of principles and depending on who you're talking to, there's like 10 basic ones and then you know, they expand from there. Um, But the first principle is observation and how important it is for us to observe the land that we're tending and understand who we are sharing that land with, what are the other species, but it also is where does the water flow on the land? Where is the wind coming from? Um, here, especially on the West Coast, it's like, where's potential fire danger? Oh, where does yeah. that come from? And how would that affect the land that you're on? And so um, there's really an encouragement to spend at least four seasons observing the land before you make any major changes. Well, that's a and great so, idea, actually. And the other piece of that is you're developing a relationship with this land. And I think it's, um, it's really about shifting our perspective from owning property to being in relationship and tending and being a species that is a part of the system, of the ecosystem. So, so that's kind of where it all begins, is with observation and really connecting with the land. And in um, nature awareness classes and teachings, they often talk about finding a sit spot. And so it's a place where you go and you sit for you know 20 minutes. Um, and the idea is that you do it regularly, daily if possible, or you know every week or every quarter, but where you go and you sit and 20 minutes is, um, you know, they say after, it takes about 15 minutes for critters to go back to their activities after you've interrupted them. And oh, so, because they know you're there. And so, right. And so, um, and then it's also about having an openness to listening and listening to what the other creatures have to say. So um, there's communication happening. It's just us slowing down and taking the time to actually listen and and yeah so it's 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 about relationship so this idea of watching for four whole seasons before you start uh, making any changes is that what you mean before you start making any changes or what we would call improvements yeah yeah but it doesn't mean It doesn't mean don't do anything. I often suggest that people put in a, you know, start start an annual vegetable garden somewhere because even if that's not gonna always be your annual garden, it's you're you're improving the soil and you're building soil and adding nutrients. And, you know, so maybe you end up planting an orchard there instead later. But, you know, so annuals are something that are, um, seasonal. So it's not going to, it's, it's not a permanent, um, plant. 
So, um, so yeah, because people are like, oh, I want to put in the orchard over here and I want to do this over there. And, but it's like, well, wait a minute, is that really where the orchard wants to go? So interesting. Um, yeah. And I guess yeah. if you're watching the water directions and the wind directions and how that's affecting the land, you might change your mind in a season or two or exactly. a year or two. That's very interesting. So the science of this um, allows for all of the different pieces to work together, almost like a, maybe a well-fit gear. That's well, it's the whole, that's it's, one so way it's to all look at it. Yeah. 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 It's hard to talk in a spherical way when you're, <laughs> when, when you're a linear person like me. <laughs> so, but, um, uh, before we got started, you had mentioned the concept of social forestry and I just find that fascinating. Can you, uh, just touch on that for a little bit and, and bring our audience kind of up to speed what that means? Absolutely. Especially here in the Pacific Northwest, where we're surrounded by forests, um, social forestry is, again, it's, it's about developing a relationship with the forest. And if you think about before colonization, indigenous folks, tribal people were tending the forest. That was, I mean, it was a very interactive process. It was, um, you know, they used fire and, um, you know, they harvested from the forest. And so it was a very, it was a relationship. Um, the forest are kin, so they're relatives. Um, and then with colonization, it became a resource that we extract. And so, it's coming back into right relationship with the forest because it's a very important part of our ecosystem. Um, and so social forestry is um, working with the forest. We're doing a lot of fuel reduction and, um, but instead of just making big slash piles and burning things, we're sorting. So we're taking poles that could be used for building. We've got material that can be used for basketry or you know, making small furniture. Oh, that's um, cool. We do, we make charcoal and biochar. So, and we're working in a group with hand tools. We're not using chainsaws and power tools. Really? So they, they still have conversations, you can hear the birds. Um, and so it's, um, and there's a whole culture around it. So it's like, how do we bring, how do we build culture and how do we bring that back into the forest? Wow. That is absolutely fascinating. Um, so these, um, traditional ancient ways that are kind of coming back into use now, um, how much of an audience are, are you finding? Are you finding people are receptive? To doing this? Are you finding that, that you've got folks that want to join in? Absolutely. We teach a social forestry class every year and it's, um, it's six days, usually in the little Applegate and we always have a waiting list. Wow. So, um, yeah, people are, are ready and wanting to, to have this connection. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wanted to study um, uh, with one of these, go into one of these six day classes, um, is, is this uh, overnight? Is this like, what, how does, what are the logistics and how do you spend mm -hmm. each day? So, um, so it's a winter course, we camp. Um, wow. And, in the winter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we start each day with song or a small ritual. Um, there's classroom time where we actually um, study some of the science around forestry and um, different practices. And then um, part of the day, and sometimes most of the day, we're actually outside actually doing work, um, you know, learning how to do forest stand assessment, how to um, manage brush, how to make biochar. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very hands-on course. 
Um, and then we cook meals together in the evening. And um, yeah, and we were actually, we, we actually had our classroom outdoors this year because of COVID. Oh. So um, we do have some simple shelters that we use for our kitchen and, and um, classroom area, but we actually met outside and it was, the, the weather was nice enough that we could do that. It wasn't too cold. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. You got to be a pretty hardy person <laughs> to do that in the apple gate in the fall, but uh, it sounds very intriguing. Um, so what is a, you said, one of the things you study, um, in these classes is, uh, assessment, uh, which we've got a break coming up. So let's just quickly touch on it and we'll get the rest of it after. Okay. So it's, it's really looking at the forest and seeing, um, what is, what are the health of the trees? Um, how much thinning needs to happen? What are materials that you can harvest for, um, you know, for different projects and use and, and it really is about the health of the forest. Well, it must be quite an art. So um, we do have to take a quick break. We're talking to Karen Taylor. She's a permaculture educator and designer. She's here locally out of Ashland. And we're going to have a more in-depth discussion of the science and the benefits right after a word from our sponsor. Do not touch that dial. Well, welcome back to The Real Estate Show, folks. I'm Alice Lima, broker John L. Scott here in Southern Oregon. And we're right in the middle of this really great educational conversation with Karen Taylor. She's a permaculture educator and designer. And right before the break, we were just starting to touch on uh, some of the classwork that she does in the forest. And there's actually a training on assessing the forest and assessing what can be done. So let's go through that again, just real quick, the walking around and what you're looking for and, and the plan you put together. Great, yeah. So one of the things we have to remember is that our forests have, they've become pretty overgrown. Um, I've, I've walked around with several different foresters. My uh, business partner, Hazel, is, um, has a forestry degree. And um, we've, we've also walked around forests with some other foresters in the area. And um, when you're looking at, especially um, like the duck fir and the ponderosa, some of the bigger trees, um, there's usually a lot more spacing in historic forest than what we have now. And so, um, so we're looking at the health of the trees, um, like how, um, you know, are they struggling? Are they getting enough sun? Um, are there too many trees growing close together? Um, so maybe there needs to be a little bit of thinning. Um, depending on where you are in the region, um, different forests tend to have different characteristics. So there's um, oak pine savanna, then we've, we've got our um, conifer forest. Uh, there's the madrone, um, you know, the forests that have a good bit of madrone in them. Um, and, you know, this isn't my expertise, but it, I'm definitely learning, I'm starting to learn more and more. Um, so I wouldn't be the one to do the forest stand assessment, but um, but in our class we'll look at what needs to be thinned and and also you have to keep in mind wildlife too. It's like you don't want to thin everything the same way across the board. There's what's called a forest mosaic. So there's areas where it's a little denser. There's areas where it's more open um, or a lot along riparian areas, you're going to leave different species. So, um, so it's definitely an art and a science. To yeah, it is very intricate, forest. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. So the idea of having on. an assessment um, right from the beginning and teaching people that I just think, you know, having a good foundation before you launch any project is uh, going to be more helpful. And I didn't really understand the 
the intricacy of these ecological systems. And, and of course you would have a mosaic. I, I'm listening to you talk. I was like, well, that makes perfect sense, you know, mm -hmm. not to thin everything the same way. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. So um, taking the concepts we were just talking about of assessment and putting together a plan and creating a more holistic uh, science about all this, how would that apply to other kinds of properties besides forest? Farming, mm -hmm. um, in town, what would well, be the water considerations? All right. Well, often on farms, there's especially larger farms, there's, there's often forest as well. And farmers are so busy that they're focusing on their crops and, you know, often don't have time to, to tend the forest. Um, there's um, Oregon Department of Forestry and the NRCS and Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District all have programs that will help people um, find funding for, for doing forestry work. And one of the first things to do though is to have a forester come out and do what's called a forest stewardship plan and, and come up with a plan for um, managing is what they call it. I like to call it tending. Um, it's a little less colonial. It's a good, um, yeah, it's a tending is <laughs> a nice word. And, um, and then there's, out of that kind of, it comes a prescription. And so it's like, how do you, um, it's like, what is the goal for the forest? Like, what are you trying to um, do? And most, most of what we're doing out here is fuel reduction in a lot of ways, but you know, how, are we, how are we managing the forest for its health and also the health of other species? So that's, that's forest. Um, and, what was your question again? <laughs> well, we're just talking about if if we're going to apply some of this science to um, farming and properties in town, and then what are water considerations? Um, just the the assessment and the putting together of a tending plan. How would that apply to farms and regular right. folks from a permaculture perspective? From a permaculture science right. standpoint. So. For farms and um, and home sites, you know, I actually live in Ashland, so I don't have a big farm. I've got, um, you know, less than a quarter of an acre. So, um, I mean, the first thing to do is to look at what are all of the things that you would like to do on your land. Um, so it's like coming up with a list of elements of, you know, do you want to have animals? Um, and what are what are the needs of those animals? You know, they need shelter, they need food, they need um, a place to to roam. They need maybe they need grazing land. So look at look at all of the the needs, and then there's also yields off of that come out of having livestock or um, certain crops. So. So you start to look at all of the pieces that you want to um, you want to have on your site, and then looking at what the needs are and what the yields, and then you try to match up um, it's what's called closing the loop. So the waste of one thing might be a resource or nutrients for another. So. Um, so animals, so say you have chickens or ducks, for instance, um, they definitely need shelter from predators, but they make really good um, manure for the garden and they are great at eating insects. So, um, and they need certain kinds of foods and grains. So maybe you can grow the food that the animals eat and then they eat it and then they poop that out that goes back into the garden that's growing their food so it's it's a closed loop that's and so integrated that's a lot of thought it's integrated but then there's also even the location of where their shelter is and maybe it goes in a place where you can catch the water off of the roof and that water goes into a tank and then you can that's the water that 
the you know that the ducks splash in. So it's how how instead of creating all of these separate systems that are independent of each other, how do we work with them so that they they um, they help each other out? So um, so yeah, integrated systems and. Hmm. It also sounds like there's no waste. There's no effort wasted. There's no location wasted. And all that is done ahead of time because you're thinking about it and watching, which right. is just so, so smart. Right. So in, um, in permaculture, we do, we spend a lot of time assessing a site and there's a whole series of steps and one of them is to look at microclimates. So to actually map. Um, so a microclimate is uh, like on the north side of your building. It might be shady and cool all winter and it stays cooler in the summer. Um, the south side is gonna be warmer. There's more sunshine. The west side gets that really hot, you know, late afternoon sun. So it's really looking at the microclimates and, you know, where are trees providing shade and, um, Maybe you have a creek that's that's you know moist and cool all year. So it's mapping those microclimates, looking at your sun, you know, the solar patterns. And then um, then there's looking at what we call sectors. And sectors are things that move across the site. So wind is a sector, um, wild animals. So if you have like an animal corridor, I've got the deer that like to go right across the front yard. So mapping in town, where, you have deer going yeah. across the front yard. <laughs> so, so mapping where the wildlife corridors are. Um, we have a fire sector where if there's you know, on a initial ignition, where would fire come from? Like, you know, is it going to come up the hill from the road below? So, um, so water, wind, fire, sun, wildlife, views are there views that you like there's views that you might want to wow you know cover up so the so there's um so that's sectors and then we look at zones and that's um if you kind of think of a a, a, a like a bullseye there's like zone mm -hmm. zero is the house zone one is the most intensively used area of your yard or farm gotcha. so it might be the pathway to the chicken coop and back um so really mapping how you're using the land now so there's four there's five zones and they kind of go out by level of um intensity of use with zone five being more is the wild land it's like um that would be you're you're going and visiting it seasonally, but you're not really, um, you know, it's it's more for the wildlife. Um, wow. And so, so yeah, so we're collecting all of this information to get a better understanding of of the land we're on, and um, and then you start making connections and putting building up these layers of understanding. So, um, yeah. So when you're, um, let's say you live in town and mm -hmm. you have a yard and you want to be more integrated and use the science of permaculture. Um, let's say you just bought a house. There's a real estate show. Let's say you just bought a house. Right. Mm -hmm. What would be the first couple of things you would do just to get ready to get your yard ready? Right. Well, one of the first things that I did was I started mapping the sun and shadow patterns. Uh huh. Um, and I chose the summer equinox and the fall. I mean, that's, I mean, summer solstice, fall equinox, and winter so solstice. It was too cloudy, so I I did not get a lot of shadows. But I started mapping my. Um, sun patterns and shade and microclimates. And, um, and water. So I really started looking at um, 
where, you know, is there water that's flowing off of my site from my house? And, you know, I, I have to have a garden. So, you know, and a lot of people here in Southern Oregon do, and we've got to yeah. take a real quick break. We're talking to Karen Taylor, permaculture educator and designer. We'll be right back after a quick word. Well, welcome back everybody to the real estate show. I'm Alice Lima. I'm a broker here, at John L. Scott in Southern Oregon. And we're just uh, talking to Karen Taylor, the permaculture educator and designer here locally. And wow, what an education we've had so far. Um, so Karen, right before the break, we were talking about if you just have a regular house, a regular yard and monitoring um, the sun patterns, the shadows, the rainfall, and the wild animals just in town. Who would have thought you could even do that? <laughs> and that's just the beauty of this science, isn't it? That can be applied to any kind of property. Absolutely. Even if you live in an apartment with just a little porch. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You can, well, well, you can use this anywhere. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. I hope we have time. You know, we could talk about this for hours and hours. Um, and I know, <laughs> we got um, one of the big uh, thoughts on people's minds right now is uh, the water and, you know, did we have a good enough winter this year and how is that going to affect things uh, for the rest of the, the 2022? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm definitely concerned about um, our snowpack and water. And so um I am looking at how can I make the most of the water that I have, and I do collect water. I've got, um, I use 500 gallon tanks, and so I have, well, those are big, 1500 gallons worth of storage, which really is not a lot of water when you're talking about irrigation. Oh, um, okay. But it's still, it's rainwater, and rainwater is you know, it's much better than groundwater if you're on a well and it's, um, yeah, and it comes off of the roof and flows into the, you know, into the storm drain otherwise. Yeah. So, and the other thing that I'm looking at is how do I reuse my gray water and how can I get my, so gray water is water that comes from the washing machine uh, showers and sinks and um, the kitchen sink as long as it's not on the um, disposal mm -hmm. so, so relatively this clean, is water not, that you're already not your sewage, using. <laughs> hmm? not, your sewage. <laughs> not yeah definitely not the toilet <laughs> but that's a whole other thing I just want to make sure we're clear people <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so going back to your gray water usage so um a fairly simple, usually, sometimes it can be more complicated, but the most, the easiest um, gray water to have access to is the laundry, the washing machine. And there's a system called Laundry to Landscape, and you're actually using the pump of the washing machine a little bit to move the water through irrigation pipe to water the plants in your yard. Really? And it's really, you know, a great way to keep a nice, well-watered area around the house, which is where you want to have a lot of moisture because it's also a fire prevention um, to have irrigated landscape Good point. near the house. Um, and it also can help create a cooler environment around the house as well. And so, um, Gray water is legal in Oregon. Um, you do need a Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, a DEQ permit. And if you're in Ashland, so, so the county and cities have different um, uh, rules around whether you need a plumbing permit or not. So that's something to research. Okay, so each municipality gets to decide. Right. Good to know. Um, but if you think about it's water that's pretty clean, I mean, there's actually some nutrients in it now because you've used it once, you've like rinsed things off, you've washed your hands, um, there's dirt from your clothes, but that's stuff that can just go back into the soil and 
and feed your plants. Never thought of it that way. That's great. <laughs> and so, um, and if you think of washing machines, the really high efficient efficiency machines, it's probably about 15 gallons a load. Um, if you have a top loader, it's like can be or an old washing machine, the older ones, it can be, you know, 20 to 40 gallons a load, depending wow. on um, how much you're washing. So, so yeah, reusing water in the landscape instead of sending it into the sewer or septic um, and collecting rainwater, but also instead of, there's some developments where the roof water is, it goes in a pipe, doesn't even touch the soil. It goes into a pipe, into the storm drain, disconnect those pipes and send it into your landscape. So you're not having to use more water to irrigate with. Wow. And so, there's ways of doing that by creating rain gardens or tree wells. Um, you know, there's a number of different ways of holding on to that water. And um, because the soil and plants are really the best way to store water. That's amazing. Um, do you happen to know any of the permit rules? Um, are there any for collecting rainwater? Is that um, just something you I can know use? in Ashland tanks have to be in the backyard. You can't have them in the front yard. And I think they can only be six feet tall. Um, That's kind of an odd rule. Why would they care? You didn't think it has, the I think it has to do with the aesthetics. Huh. <laughs> I okay. know, right? I'm like, I want my tank in the front yard so everybody can see it, right? Huh. All right, well, moving on. <laughs> no offense, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's a limit to how much you can collect. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. um, in the county, you can divert rainwater into, I'm pretty sure you can divert it into a lined pond. Um, as long as it never touches the ground. So once it touches the ground, then it's surface water. Mm -hmm. But if you're directing it directly from a downspout through a pipe into a pond structure, um, I'm pretty sure you can do that. There's some, there's some um, rules and regulations based on the size of the pond and how big the dam is and that sort of thing. Um, well, yeah, that, those um, those techniques sound fairly inexpensive and not too complicated. Um, and if we are facing another drought year, um, it might uh, it might help if enough people do that. It might help. Yes. And the, if you think about it, especially in developed areas where we have roads and parking lots, the water that falls on those surfaces used to soak into the ground. Right. And now it's running off. And so we're trying to hold on as much of that water high in the landscape, high in the watershed, allowing it to soak in and slow down. And in a way it feeds, it feeds the aquifers and it's, and it feeds the watershed. Um, yeah. And that so, is the integration of it all, isn't it? So I was going to just say, um, Brad Lancaster is a water um, water harvesting guru in Tucson, Arizona. He has a couple of books called um, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. And um, and I also just wanted to say the um, my business is Sisky Permaculture. And we have a website that's cystipermaculture.org and we teach classes and do consultations. And but how about a quick cell phone with the few seconds we have left? Um, my phone number is 541-690-7376. Great. And Thank you, Karen, yeah. permaculture educator and designer. This broadcast will be repeated tomorrow at six o'clock. We'll have you back again, Karen. That was great. Have a great weekend, everybody.